Well, um, first of all, I guess I should say that I'm not a, a, a Nebraska writer per se. I'm not, I'm not a poet. I'm not a novelist. Uh, I'm, I do some memoir writing, but I don't publish very much in that way. Mm -hmm. Most of my work has been in criticism. And uh, I remember reading a uh, Wright Morris novel at graduate school in, in Chicago and uh, not liking it. In fact, it was the home place. Didn't like it. Didn't think it worked. And then uh, when I went to uh, my PhD program at Purdue, I was introduced to the works of love in a seminar, and I was immediately caught up and decided pretty much during that seminar that I was going to do my dissertation on Morris. And so I think a lot of my being in Nebraska has to do with my selection of Wright Morris as my topic. And it's proven to be a very nice, uh, a very nice topic for me. And, and, uh, um, it's it's been exciting. Okay. No, I can tell you what happened though. I was when I was a, a freshman in college. I I always read a lot, but when I was a freshman in college at Oshkosh State, um, I was introduced. I had to read a book. I had to read a book that was a classic. And uh, I didn't think I could read classics. I wasn't brought up that way. And mm -hmm. I read a lot of you know, strange things, but not classics. Mm -hmm. But I chose, for some reason, The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. And I realized then that I could read the classics mm -hmm. and that they spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And so from then on, I started to read. And shortly after that, I was writing pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I, I really liked, the people I liked most were Fitzgerald, Hemingway, uh, you know, the, the 20s novelists. Um, William Faulkner was a big influence on my, when I was writing fiction, I wrote a little bit of fiction. Uh, probably the biggest thing that I did was a short novel that's unpublished, but heavily influenced by, by uh, Faulkner. Um, Nothing that I would go back and publish or even try to publish. I I pretty much need to write. Yeah, I find writing is a way to figure it out, figure out what's going on. Uh, I was I was speaking at a at a conference a while back. Uh, actually, it was a I was sort of a a speaker for um, the, the writing program at at one of the universities and. Uh, I found myself saying that writing is important because it gives you freedom, and I think that I think that's really the best statement I can make about writing. It's, it gives you freedom. You get a chance to remake the world with your own words and figure it out, as I said before. Whiskey. No, I'm. <laughs> what inspires me to write? Um, when I when I get the yen to do so. Um, when I've got a presentation to, to, to do or when I want to write something on, uh, on uh, some topic, I'll sit down and I'll do it. And I always told my students that how to write is to start with a blank slate, you have nothing there, and you fill it quickly with junk. Mm -hmm. And then what you do after that is you clean it up. And the cleaning up is what I, what I, what I really like. Mm -hmm. I like the, the process of editing it. Mm -hmm. So my manuscripts in the very beginning get a lot of junk piled in them. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I, I work my way to clearing that up, making sense of it. Mm -hmm. I've written on all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Tobias Wolf, um, Thomas McGuane, Mary Gateskill. Um, Recently, I've been writing on American architecture, American, uh, Midwestern American architecture, uh, architecture and art in the age of realism, 1870s to 1910 or so. Um, something on American autobiography, which is one of my interests. So I've been writing a lot of different kinds of things like that. And then fooling around with autobiography, with memoir. I've written quite a few pages, but in very, as I said before, a very rough form, you know, very, very junk. <laughs> um, it has to be in the morning to be most effective, but uh, I can work almost any time. Uh, I was at that 
Center for the a center for the book last two weeks ago, and I spoke to that young poet who says he gets up every day at 5.30 in the morning. I couldn't do that. I could never do that. Um, so usually between 9 and noon is my best time. But it, I like to work in short spurts, too. It's academic. I have an academic voice. Um, that's always a thing to struggle with, though. When I'm yeah. when I'm writing memoir, uh, that's always a difficult thing to come up with. I have to figure out my audience. Who 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 am I talking to here, mm -hmm. and how do I imagine that person or those those people, and uh, and how much do I want to reveal, and how do I want to reveal that, and mm -hmm. so voice is very interesting in that in that regard. But I don't find it a problem with academic writing as long as I know who I'm writing it for. Mm -hmm. Uh, practice composition first of all. Know how to put a sentence together, and then how, and then, and then once they get past that, then they can start playing around with it. Um, I'm mostly composition student kind of thing, and the, the rest will take care of itself. I'd like to really pursue memoir more, and. Um, um, I'm working with a group in Michigan putting together a dictionary of Midwestern literature, the second volume. Mm -hmm. And I would like to finish that out and make sure that we get that in press. That's a couple of years overdue already. That's important. And I would like to work on a, an anthology, this is, I almost forgot, an anthology of Nebraska literature. The state does not have one. The one that I'm not that I'm aware of. I mean, covering the range from 1835 or so up to 2000, we need an anthology of some of the important writings, and maybe that's because we're blessed with so many great writers here that they take all the oxygen. But I think a good anthology. Some of the playwrights that we've had are tremendous, and nobody reads them. Um, poets, uh, some of the early poets, the University of Nebraska, were very good too. And some novelists from the Depression era that we need to have people know about. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room, and I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John A. James Reading Series. We're excited that this series has been in existence for more than 25 years. The Ames readings are currently held, obviously, on the third Sunday of the of the month at 2 p.m. and here you are to enjoy us. Enjoy it, thanks for being here. This is the 191st reading in this series. So next year, we can look forward to 200. So I hope you'll be around for that too. Um, we are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection, obviously, more than 13,000 volumes here, uh, written by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. We also do have information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, um, artwork on the wall if you look around the room, and memorabilia. And by the way, the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It is supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, and we'd like to thank the NLHA for the endowment established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. We'd also like to have you visit the Heritage Room when we're open during our regular public service hours. We are open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3, and on Sunday from 2 to 5, and so actually we are here during open public service hours right now. The Ames readings are filmed by Five City TV, and for those of you who are not here in the room with us watching today, but are watching on Five City TV, we are located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library in downtown Lincoln at 14th and N Streets. Our reader today is Joe Wideven, Professor Emeritus at Bellevue University in Bellevue, Nebraska. Joe earned degrees in, in, at Indiana University, DePaul University, and Purdue University. And I think he went to school in, in Wisconsin, too, and I didn't, didn't put that in there. Um, he did write his dissertation on Wright Morris back in the days in, when he lived in Indiana. And over the years, he has become quite interested in this Nebraska author and photographer. 
He first met Morris and his wife Jo in California in 1979 and had at least six visits there with Morris before the writer's death in 1998. He presented a special program about Morris in the Heritage Room here in 1985, quite a few years ago, and he wrote a book about him, Write Morris Revisited, which was published by Twain in 1998. Joe has sought to give us a deeper appreciation of Morris, who is surely one of the most independent, original, and complex writers to come from our state. Morris was a very productive writer, also one of the most productive writers in his generation, and he was one of the few who could claim the invention in the photo text of a new literary form. Since Wright Morris's book, The Home Place, has been the 2010 One Book, One, book, One Nebraska title, it seems fitting to have Joe return to the Heritage Room to talk about one of his favorite topics. So if you could help me welcome him, we're happy to have him here today. <clears throat> Thank you, Meredith. It's nice to hear Morris described as complex and difficult because I always find him so, and that's why I like him so much. My goal today is to talk a little bit about my own writing. I guess that this is a reading series. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an imposter here as I'm not really a Nebraska writer per se. I don't write novels. I don't write poetry. I'm dabbling around with memoir lately, but um, I am a, I'm, a, I'm a critic. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a literary critic. And most of my work's been done on Wright Morris. So that's why I'm a Nebraska writer, I guess. I've been writing since I was eight years old. I wrote a very moralistic school play, actually produced in the fourth grade was about the evils of smoking. <laughs> How little did I know at the time. I wrote a police procedural short story without an ending in high school. I wrote some lengthy ballads to curry the favors of my girlfriend. I had some short stories published when I was an undergraduate at Oshkosh State College. That's the one that I always neglect to mention. Because I didn't stay there, I graduated later at Indiana University, a place I dearly loved. And uh, my, part of my favorite piece, an unpublished work, a uh, short novel, written under the very heady influence of William Faulkner. Um, I love Faulkner. I had a great seminar. Two credits, read everything that he wrote for two credits. Now if I tried to teach William Faulkner in a seminar, I'd have to limit it to three books, maybe. And maybe the three best, if we could figure out what the best are. But then came an understanding that I needed to work for a living, coupled with a recognition that I did not have the requisite talent or patience for to be a fiction writer. But it is my critical work on Morris that has most occupied me as a writer. My first critical work on Morris was my dissertation at Purdue in 1979 and presentation on articles on Morris starting that year and continuing to the present. Actually, I've got two pieces coming out next year. My book, Write Morris Revisited, pictured here, a little self-promotion, was published in uh, 1998. And unfortunately, Morris had died like two, two months before, um, so he never saw it. Although I did have uh, lots of um, to do with uh, his wife, um, Jo, uh, afterwards. Um, I'm almost done with mine now. Trying to diversify my output over the years, I wrote articles and pre presented, uh, did presentations on people like Tobias Wolf, um, Thomas McGuane, Mary Gateskill, um, did works on, um, um, even for a time on Russian literary dystopian uh, literature, um, John Gold Cousins, American art lately, American architecture, I'm working now on the idea of publishing an anthology. You know that, uh, Mary Kay, we've talked about this a number of times. Um, I've, been, I've, I've approached the press to uh, come up with an anthology of Nebraska writers that goes back to the beginnings, say in the 1830s. Um, we don't have one. This is uh, none that I've found. Does anyone know of one? 
there is not an anthology of Nebraska's historical literature, and there's some really good things. I was talking to, uh, with Meredith before, and I think one of the reasons why we don't have one is we're so rich in really great writers here, Cather and Sandoz and Morris and Nyhart, etc. So maybe they, they take all the oxygen out of, out, of, out of the air here. But I think it's time, and I think it's very useful it would be very useful to have an anthology of some of the highlights, the playwrights and the poets from the late 19th century or uh, the early 20th century. The Depression novelists nobody ever remembers anymore. Okay, um, today I want to focus, because of its status as the One Book, One Nebraska book, primarily on the home place, but I thought I would also expand a little bit. Um, I'm assuming everybody's read that book recently. I've had groups that I've talked with that have not read the book, and so I'm not sure that anything that I say makes sense. Um, and give you a little preview of one of my essays that's coming out next year on Morris's literary architecture. And he both photographed architecture, and as you'll see in some of the excerpts that I'll read to you, um, he also incorporated uh, architecture into many of his works in interesting ways. But first, a very brief overview of Morris himself. I don't know if you got a, a copy of the handout that I had back there. Um, I, I, I made a handout, and I think uh, Meredith also has one. She's passing them out. I, this is just a one-sheet one um, summary of Morris's career. I think there are 32 books on this on this list, and I've highlighted uh, those that I especially recommend. Uh, perhaps others would recommend other books. And at the bottom, three books of of, uh, of commentary on his photography. The last one by Alan Trachtenberg, particularly interesting. But uh, I think the best photographs, the best place to see Morris's photographs, is a book called. Um, Oh, it's not even on here. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's called, um, where is it? Photographs and Words, 1982. Laser scanned prints that Jim Allender made out in California. And it's really, those are very nice photographs. The best place, I think, to see them. Uh, at any rate, you can see that he wrote a lot, about 20 novels and uh, memoirs and all sorts of other things. He was born in January 6, 1910 in Central City, Nebraska, and died in April 1998 in Mill Valley, California. He had an early interest in both photography and uh, literature, and um, as Meredith mentioned, he merged them into a, an invention, his own invention called phototext. Now, phototext was much in the air at that time period, in the 1930s, when he was starting to work on these things. But he was the first one to, to uh, try to use an imaginative, more imaginative devices, not, not documentary. And he pr produced not only the writing, but the photographs. So most of the other books from the Depression era in that, in that uh, manner are by f photographers on one hand and then a writer on the other. So um, anyway, part one here. Morris's history with photo texts. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Crucial to photo texts is Morris's discovery of his childhood when he went abroad in 1933, 1934, as recounted in Solo, published in 1983. It's always interesting to see how writers get their start. In Morris's case, at least once he set his mind to it, he seemed to have absolutely no doubt that he was going to be able to become a successful writer. Now, he never, I think he would have liked to have had also a very successful uh, career as in making money off his writing. I don't think he did very well with that. I think he had one blockbuster, and that's a novel that doesn't um, call it the um, Love Among the Cannibals, which is not about Nebraska, but it uh, had some sexual titillation in it, so I think that's why it sold so well. The impetus for his writing seems to have been reflections upon his strange childhood. 
and his status in the world and what he called being half an orphan, as he described his situation in Will's Boy. Next slide. His first memoir, published in 1981, how crucial to his life and career was the absence of his mother, who died when she was when he was six days old. Um, that that absence, that lack, drove him. Um, I argued uh, in, an, in an article that you can see traces of that throughout most of his Nebraska works, and even some of the works that aren't Nebraskan. When he died, he was buried next to his mother in Chapman, Nebraska. So that makes him half an orphan. Sometimes he thought he was a whole orphan because his father would uh, pick him up and drop him off pretty much at will, he left him with neighbors and acquaintances and relatives, and off he would go for two or three weeks. And then he would come back. And uh, he made interesting trips. They had made interesting trips to Chicago and uh, California, Los Angeles particularly, on roads, 1920s roads. Can you imagine going out to California in 1920 with the uh, automobiles and the condition they were and the roads that sometimes didn't exist? It wasn't until 1950s that the interstate system came in under Eisenhower. So some of those stories are interesting. Uh, as in this novel, some of these trips show up in Morris's memoirs and novels. This is his first novel published in 1942, and it's a road book, one of those road books that, that we love so well in America. They take, they buy cars and they take passengers, and the cars don't hold up, and then they got to buy a new car, and then they get abandoned by the passengers, and then they have to uh, buy a new car which has got sand in the uh, transmission and things like that because they're trying to make it sound good when they sell it. They know that when they, when they go down the road with the car, the sand will, of course, mess up the gears and then it won't work anymore, but they'll be out of town by that time. It was probably on his trip to Europe that Morris first got homesick for his Nebraska past. He was there a long time, and he talks about that a lot in his book. Back in the United States, after his trip abroad, Morris could not decide between writing and photography as his appropriate mode of expression. And so his artistic development between 1933 and 1940 was slow and tentative. From his indecision originated the causal claim, a chain, which constitutes his career. He opted, to, he opted for intertextuality for his first publications. That is, in this case, the merging of photographs and text. And, and although he mostly abandoned active photography in the 1950s, the results of his experimentation were later incorporated into his prose style and the content of his work. I think in, if you look at the works of love in certain ways, uh, it looks like a photograph album uh, with print instead of photographs. Just one picture after another. A second important aspect of his artistic development was an interest in vernacular architecture, that is, everyday architecture in American life. An interest that was aided and abetted by Morris's reading of Henry David Thoreau. Beginning with his first serious publication, The Inhabitants, and a photo text shown at the New School for Social Research in 1940, Morris responded to Thoreau. Two years before, in 1938, Morris had spent a winter living alone in a cabin on Quassapog Pond near Middlebury, Connecticut where his wife was teaching, but she, she wasn't allowed to have, um, they didn't have any married housing apparently, so he had to find his own housing while she taught at the Westover School. And so he found this cabin out in the woods. And that's where he actually discovered Walden. He was continuing his, his experiments in this ice cold cabin throughout the winter there. It was there, he says, he read the way that he first read Walden and came across passages that resonated with him. Later in writing my life from 1985, he called this my Thoreau period. So, I mean, Thoreau is not often talked about in reference to Morris, but I think he's an important influence. What Morris takes from Thoreau is not his, his critique of capitalism, but his reverence for houses that reflect natural processes and whose spirit is shaped by those who live in them. Morris adds his own attraction to abandoned houses, 
which still provide evidence of the, lived, of the lives once lived within them. He often spoke of these houses as being haunted, uh, a language he uses in several works. His first published results of this photo text experimentation, incidentally his first publication, I've already mentioned, that's the uh, photo text essay called The Inhabitants in New Directions, 1940. And in the, next, next slide, uh, back one. In, the, um, in this uh, annual edition of New Directions, he was with good company, as you can see here. He's with um, uh, James A. G. and Walker Revin's early publication of the colon section from Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, a book which is now more famous than anything Morris ever did. Um, and if you haven't read it, that's a wonderful book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. If you can get through AG's, let's say, turgid prose. I love it, but it takes, uh, it's an acquired taste. And that's, I guess, why I like Bart Morris, too. Okay, next slide. That's the uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Now, in, in Morris's photography, you very seldom see a face. If you see a face in the, in the home place, usually it's sort of wiped out, wiped out, like the negative's been, like the face has been erased on the negative. He doesn't want to deal with actual people. Oh, that's terrible to say that. I'll have to talk about that some more later um, because it's very complicated. But he does not take photographs of people, at least to show their faces. In this essay, uh, in this first essay in 1940, Morris paired brief prose... Pa uh, Morris... Next slide. Morris... No, back one. That's it. I'm sorry. In the essay, Morris paired brief prose passages on one side of the page with photographs on the other and explained his method cryptically. You can figure this out. Two separate mediums are employed for two distinct views. Is that what, that, go ahead, that slide up? Okay. Only when refocused in the mind's eye will the third view result. The burden of technique is the reader's alone. His willingness to participate rather than spectate or merely look will determine his range. It makes no demand beyond a suspension of old formula. I puzzled and puzzled over that. Now how this refocusing beyond a suspension of old formula was to be accomplished, Morris did not say. But the philosophical challenge he laid down is of considerable interest. The next important photo text appeared in 1946, and it is here that Morris's response to Thoreau is found most explicitly in the Inhabitants, a book-length version of the earlier essay published in 1946, a book that Stephen Longmire, a young, the only young Wright Morris scholar I know, uh, and also photographer, is aptly called A Survey of American Vernacular Architecture. Uh, most of the photographs in there are of buildings. Next slide. Okay. Moore sets the scene for his theme by using an epigraph, a passage as epigraph, a passage from Walden. What of architectural beauty I now see I know it's gradually grown from within outward out of the necessities and character of the indweller, who was the only builder. Out of some unconscious truthfulness and nobleness without ever a thought for the appearance. And whatever additional beauty of this kind is destined to be produced will be preceded by a like unconscious beauty of life. It is the life of the inhabitants whose shells they are. So that's the title, but even some of this language creeps into Morris's prose. If you read The Home Place recently, you may have seen echoes of that in, in The Home Place. In this text, in his own text, Morris quotes Thoreau to support his idea that the act of living inside houses confers a kind of holiness. For example, part of the first text in the book reads, Thoreau, a look, is what a man gets when he tries to inhabit something something like America. 
I guess a look is what a man gets not so much from inhabiting something as from something that's inhabiting him. Maybe this is what it is that inhabits a house. An inhabitant is what you can't take away from a house. You can take away everything else. In fact, the more you take away, the better you can see what that thing is. That's how you know. That's how you can tell an, an inhabitant. Now here's an example of a two-page spread from the volume. I don't think I'm going to read this. I can't see it for one thing. Um, can, you, can you even read that print? But you get the general idea. That's the photo text spread. There are 52 of these in the, in the, in the inhabitant's text. And um, the top is a response. It's his response to Thoreau. Every page has three elements, the picture, the, th the response to Thoreau, and then the actual text. And this text is uh, actually about a couple of kids that sneak up because it's the end of the world. It's been announced that the end of the world is coming. So the two kids sneak up into the, into the grain elevator so they can watch it end from there. And I think the last line is, uh, the last two lines, the end of the world, I said. Hooray, said Dean Cole. The book contains 52 photo texts, most of non-Nebraska locations, and few texts make spe specific reference to Nebraska. All the photographs are of exteriors, of houses, grain elevators, churches, banks, and so forth, from across the United States, mostly in the East. Morris was pursuing a project he had in mind as early as 1940, that is, to write not one book, but a series, each dealing with a phase of our national life as I had experienced it. In visual terms, Morris confessed that he was interested in the old, the worn and worn out, the decline, the time ravaged, the used, abused, and abandoned, as well as the structured volumes, the contrasts in texture, the endless gradations from black to white in stone, shingle, clabbered, painted, or peeling, and so on. So he pretty much knew what he was looking for when he took photographs. But Morris never followed through on this ambitious plan because his rediscovery of Nebraska intervened. By chance or on purpose, in 1942, Morris and his wife returned to the Nebraska home place of his uncle Harry and Aunt Clara. That the visit was significant is found in his comment that by the time he left, he had committed himself to, quote, a pact with the bygone, the recovery of a past I had only dimly sensed that I possessed. I was blissfully ignorant of any awareness that this would prove to be the work of a lifetime. In 1947, he did return, armed with a Guggenheim Fellowship and his cameras and tripod. Because of this return, coupled with his attempts to recapture moments of his strange childhood, his interest in photo text veered sharply from sociological to intensely personal, if not quite obsessional, concerns. This new focus was found almost immediately in his next book, The Home Place. I have the, an early Bison copy um, cover and the photograph that he took, which is on the cover. This is arguably his first and major work and one that marks an important transition on his career while expanding his Thoreauvian outlook. The book is his first and only attempt to employ fiction as a text in photo text. It is also the first of his photo text to picture interiors. So part two, Mars is the home place. I discussed this book with uh, quite a few groups this year and actually over the years to the Nebraska Humanities Council. I've come to think that The Home Place is a significant American book. But I have also come to believe that this is not a book that is easy to love. Uh, I don't think that the vast majority, that the majority of the people I talked with like this book. Uh, I think partially that's because it's as Merritt said before, it's complex. It's more complex than it appears. It appears simple. Um, pictures in it, a simple story, and what else is there? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. The pictures are fine, the complaint might be, but the narrator is often critical and cantankerous. The story he tells doesn't seem to have a plot. 
There is a good deal of philosophical talk about figures in carpets, photographic vision, and ideas of privacy. The setting of the home place and of the photographs found in it is the broken down house of his aunt, of his aunt Clara and Uncle Harry. It's about four miles uh, south of Norfolk, Nebraska, where Morris had spent some memorable weeks as a boy. The format continues to confuse many readers who think the photographs are meant to illustrate the novel, which was clearly not what Morris intended. Rather, he still appears to have wanted readers to come up with a third view of their own. That right there is a complexity because he's got a plot line, he's got it all laid out on the page, and yet he wants readers to come up with their own ideas. In telling the story, there are various photographs of this ruin of a house and associated structures, including a few showing Uncle Harry from the back or side, and photographs of rural churches, train stations, barber shops, grain elevators, and the like. The text of the home place is fairly simple, telling the story of return native Clyde Muncie and his wife and two children. They've been living in New York. They um, and. They hope, perhaps, that they can find a house to live in in Nebraska. This is the, the housing shortage in 19, uh, after following World War II in the 1940s. So there was a housing shortage when the uh, servicemen came back from, from the war. They've been living in a small apartment in New York City, and um, the novel's argument is set up largely in terms of contraries, city versus country, modern versus traditional, inhabitants versus transients. Nebraska's Ivy, Nebraska and Ivy's claims versus those of the New Yorker Muncie. In addition to those polarities, there are, sub, there are subtextual interactions between photographs and text and subtle photographic vision set against direct rural simplicity. The home place, next slide. The home place can be seen as having a number of separate parts. To my thinking, there are six such parts. In discussing these, I will show you some of the photographs in the text. In the first part, Muncie returns to the home place with his city wife and two city-bred children. In this section, there is much discussion of rural things and the contrast between city and country experience. In part two, we have the arrival of Ivy Muncie and his wife at the house, renewal of acquaintances with others of the family, there's talk here of the town, of Eddie Kehau, and of the trains that cross the plains. The third part is the trip to town. Good. The town is Lone Tree. Now, Lone Tree is actually Central City, but he was talking about the home place, which is up near Norfolk, so a little bit more uh, fictional obfuscation, perhaps. Um, next slide. And uh, Eddie K. Howe's barber shop, where emergency work has to be done on the two kids who've dipped their heads into flypaper and they can't get loose from it. And so the, Eddie K. Howe has to take all their hair off. And part of the humor of the book is when, when Clyde thinks about what he's going to tell his wife when he brings the kids back, his darling little girl and his boy, who are now bald as cue balls. This is also where we get a taste of Muncie Morris's philosophizing about Plains ontology, his view of the nature of being on the Great Plains. I'll read this one. Later, if the town lasts, they're put through some tracks with a water tower for the whistle stop, and if it rained now and then, they'd put up the monument. That's the way these elevators, these Great Plains monoliths, strike me. There's a simple reason for green elevators, as there is for everything. But the force behind the reason, the reason for the reason, is the land and the sky. There's too much sky out here, for one thing. Too much horizontal. Too many lines without stop. Without the exclamation, the perpendicular had to come. Anyone who was born and raised on the plains knows that the high false front on the feed store and the white water tower are not a question of vanity. It's a problem of being, of knowing you are there. In part four, they return to the farm, where a picnic is being laid out for the families and guests, including Mother Cropper and Viola. 
There's a wonderful line there that I, that I really like. They're eating their dinners, and one of the people says to the other, you've been to the peas, you've been to the peas yet. It's a wonderful line to use at Thanksgiving dinner. You should use it next week. You've been to the turkey yet? You've, had, you've been to the dressing? <laughs> now in part five, the most important section of the book, Muncie and his wife make their visit to Ed's place. Ed's place is the place they might want to live in. To check it out, Ed is ill and being taken care of in town is expected to die soon, so the house will be available at that time. Right. This is actually Ed's place, um, courtesy of Phyllis McCain, who lives there now. She's a family member. She owns this house and uh, is restoring it. In fact, since this photograph, was, I took this photograph and during the summer. Um, no, not yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> took this photograph during the summer. Uh, she's had, I think, I think she's had it painted, to, uh, thoroughly painted. She's restoring it and trying to bring some back, some of the artifacts back to it. The intimate effect. The intimate effects Clyde and Peg encounter in the house and the feelings they elicit evoke Morris's most trenchant writing on the haunted quality of vacant houses. <laughs> when Peg enters the house, Clyde observes that she came to the center of the room like you do in a haunted house. My own feeling is that only vacant houses are occupied or haunted, which is a better word. More extensively about such a vacant house, Clyde insists, any house that's been lived in, any room that's been slept in is not vacant anymore. From that point on, it's forever occupied. With the people gone, you know the place is inhabited. There's something in the rooms in the air that raising the windows won't let out. The closets are full of clothes you can't air out. There's a pattern on the walls where the calendar is hung. And the tip square of a missing picture is a lidded eye on something private, something better not seen. The figure on the carpet is what you have when the people have died there. Uh, sorry, the people have lived there, died there, and when evicted, refused to leave the house. It is soon clear to Clyde and Peg that they do not belong there. The photographs show country things and more intimately Ed's bed, ragged clothing hung on pegs and more intimately, and the contents of the house, of the dresser drawers, including simple country verses of meaning to him that he had cut out from newspapers. When Clyde locks the door behind him, he tells us, I felt like a man whose job it was to close up a church. In this passion, that was the word for a man's house, the citadel, the chapel of his character. Peg and Clyde have quickly come to understand that they don't have the requisite history or the appropriate experience to live in Ed's house. The final section, called the recessional, is a reverent meditation, what I call the recessional, is a reverent meditation on country life. It focuses, focuses on, a, on a family picture uh, from, from 1892, and the family members are sitting around talking about the people that are pictured in it, parts of the family. And they're thinking about what happened this and that and so forth. Here's one photograph that pairs a brief discussion of two brothers in the family. Um, Morris writes, they're a pair if we're looking alike. Across from a photograph of these two false-fronted commercial structures. And at the very end, we have Uncle Harry entering barn. That's the last picture in the book. And... Um, it's uh, quite a bit about um, the fact that if you've lived in this all of your life, then you don't have to worry about about being about dying. You you'll have a ripeness about you, and it talks about. It doesn't talk about this photograph, but it seems to work well with this photograph. Coming to terms with the home place. Next slide. Part of the problem, I think is that it is a book that is more complex than it appears. It makes demands on readers and raises questions that are not easy to answer. First of all, what kind of a book is it? Where does it fit as a genre? Is this a novel? Is it fact or fiction or something in between? 
the people who own the farm are Morris's real aunt, Clara, and Uncle Harry, but the main character and narrator, Clyde Muncy, is not Wright Morris himself. So we have a fictional story told with the assistance of photographs of a very real place inhabited by people who really are Morris's aunt and uncle, narrated by a narrator who is not Wright Morris, but a man named Clyde Muncy, who is always trying to analyze everything. And what are we supposed to do with the photographs? This is a work of fiction, but the photographs are not fictional. They picture the very real everyday world of Uncle Harry and Aunt Clara. So what's the relationship between the real photographs and the fictional text? Moreover, it doesn't seem to emphasize a story. So what's the central message of the book? What's its central theme? We can say that this is a book at least in part about the world of the farm and the complicated respect that Clyde Muncy feels for the lives who inhabit it. But if you've read the book, you know he's, uh, Clyde, Clyde's got a kind of an edgy voice. Next slide. But it is also a book about the right to and the sacredness of privacy. Muncy speaks often of feeling like someone who is spying on Harry and Clara and especially Ed's privacy, yet some of the photographs, one might argue, all of them seem to violate this idea of privacy, as this photograph seems to. This one's taken as if by stealth through a covered nighttime window. At least it gives the appearance of being, of a person being spied upon so that the photographer is a voyeur. That the camera is an intruder is verbally evidenced as well in the home place. The crucial scene is Muncie is Munce and Peggy's entrance into Ed's place. At one point, they glance through Ed's album of newspaper clippings, connecting Ed's selection of clippings to his personal life. And this is the text. I stood there looking at the page, doing my best to ignore the fact that I felt more and more like some sly peeping Tom. I put my hand up to my face as it occurred to me suddenly how people look in a daily news photograph. God only knows why I thought of that, but I put up my hands covering my face as if I was there on the spot and didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to be violated, that is. The camera eye knows no privacy. The really private is its business. And in our time, business is good. He ain't seen nothing yet. Really. I mean, that's 1948. Things are much worse now. But what in God's name did that have to do with me? At the moment, I guess, I was that kind of camera. Is the book an elegy? A mournful poem, a lament for the dead, for things that are dying? If it is an elegy, why is it not delivered as an elegy, but rather in the often edgy voice of Clyde Muncy? Next slide. And what are we supposed to do with this right at the beginning? This is a picture of uh, Henry James. You can move on to the next slide. As epigraph, Morris uses a selection from Henry James's the American scene. Uh, it's, it's a quotation from James that Morris obviously likes because he uses it here. Something that is we are intended to read before we read the text proper. That's what an epigraph is for, I think. Something intended to provoke a slanted directive as to how to read the book that we're about to read. And here's the text. I've highlighted some of the elements in it to draw more attention to them. This is what James writes and what Morris loves about it. To be at all critically, as we have been fond of calling it, analytically minded, over and beyond an inherent love of the general many colored pictures of things, is to be subject to the superstition that objects and places coherently grouped, disposed for human use and addressed to it, must have a sense of their own a mystic meaning proper to themselves to give out. To give out, that is, to the participant at once so interested and so detached as to be moved to a report of the matter. 
That's typical, James. I was um, tickled yesterday to read a book review of a new book by uh, Cynthia Ozick. Uh, the review was by Thomas Mallon, and because Ozick's book is based on one of more of one of uh, James's books, this I, I just have this clause, this, this part of a sentence to read to you. This is how Thomas Mallon describes James. James' proliferating clauses sometimes exist only to subordinate themselves into an ecstasy of avoidance. Morris called um, Henry James's style parenthetical. As soon as you read the first part of a sentence, you then move on into a parenthesis, and the rest of the book is, a, is parentheses. You're always getting parenthetical material. But look at the indirection of this, the indirection, the, the, um, the sheer imprecision, the ambiguity. Why is Morris so attracted to it? Well, first of all, he wants to account for, to report on, the significance of the photographs in the book. The pictured objects, he suggests, have a mystic meaning proper to themselves to give out. The objects themselves are said to be attached to human use. They're co they're co they're, they are coherently grouped, disposed for human use, and addressed to it. He also says that a person reporting on the objects must be both interested and detached, surely a difficult position for the mind to be in, perhaps similar to the participant-observer ID in sociology. And most puzzling of all, James suggests that, well, after all, this idea might just be a superstition, an old wife's tale. I suspect the man who chose that epigraph is the right Morris who often eludes us who likes to toy with us and make us think more than we want to. This apparently simple storyteller with strong Nebraska umbilical connection seems to want to puzzle us with big city notions, a little like his protagonist Clyde Muncy, who both admires the old-fashioned rural virtues of abstinence, frugality, and independence, and at the same time can't resist his big New York City wisecracking. Muncie's wife, Peg, says at one point, it's all right for you to share their lives. That's fine. But they don't give a damn about yours. This is the Morris that shows up in many of his books. Oh. You have these dichotomies. The Nebraska past, the distant world beyond, the country, the city, pros and photography, reverence for rural virtues and criticism of their lack of sophistication, both, no, both nostalgia for the past and nausea because it's the past, as he discusses in his next book, The World in the Attic, and both terse rural understatement and the writer's and protagonist's need for complex explanations, as in this example. Okay. It's pretty hot weather for canning, I said. He's talking to his Aunt Clara. I've seen it a good deal better. Uh, sorry, hotter, she says, and I've seen it cooler. I can tell hot and cold. Maybe I'd forgotten she could be like that. I wiped my hands with a towel and tried to think how to turn that one. I couldn't. <laughs> What's this I hear about Uncle Ed, I said. I don't know, she said, unless you heard he was dying. That's what I heard. She didn't go on, so I said, Ed's lived a long life. Guess we can't live forever. Nobody has, she said. <laughs> One more slide from the book. City Hall, Tecumseh. Um, an image that you can still see. You can actually go to Tecumseh and visit this. It's a little bit changed, but not that much. Uh, I won't go into details because I'm running short on time, but uh, think of the idea of this building being made by two different architects uh, with different plans and with different ideas and moods and attitudes. Um, the two sides, the front, the right side seems to be pushing forward, the left side pushed back. The windows don't look alike on the two sides. Um, as I recall, there's a, the finials don't match at the top. Um, the gables don't match at the top, um, and one finial is missing. Some additional photographs not in the home place that I'd like to share with you. The Gano Green Elevator, sorry, uh, next one. 
the uh, well, I think it's I think it's an old grain elevator, at Western Kansas. This is not in the text, although it would certainly fit there. Um, this is um, an iconic image of Morris's. I think actually all three of these that I'm talking about now are iconic images. But this is like a store, a 30-story building that existed in western Kansas. You can still see Gano elevators there in bad repair, abandoned, but not like this. This was 30 stories high, so Morris says. This one has burned down. You get some idea of the scale by looking at the railroad at the, at, the, at the bottom of the picture, toward the bottom of the picture, and the hotel or whatever just beyond it. And then the building lurches up into the sky, pointed like an arrow. Next one. Rocker home place. We saw this rocker in an earlier photograph, but he's reconfigured it here. Uh, this looks like a rocker that um, Morris's um, characters could sit in and think about the past. Uh, the kind of things that, that his characters talk about a lot in uh, Ceremony and Lone Tree. And, and then the next slide, uh, reflection oval mirror, a very complex image. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to talk much about it. But um, just, to, just to think about taking this photograph into a mirror uh, so that the, most of the objects are behind us, are behind the photographer. And then I think this is probably about memory. This photograph is about the idea of memory because the, I look at the, the door and it's, it's blurry, it's wavy features in the door because of the distortion in the mirror. Well, I want to go into this and into a great, great length of time. I've spent lots of times uh, talking about this with many people, um, including this question. Is that door fastened to the wall or is it just lying up against the wall? I'll leave you with that question. Uh, what happened to the home place? Next slide. Morris wrote in several places that the home place, Uncle Harry and Aunt Clara's house, had been plowed under. Said that at least in two or three places. But taint so. Here it is. Oops, next slide. Oops, back up. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I keep going. Next one. There it is, I'm sorry. It's been moved down the road from where it used to be, but it still exists. Um, it's uh, about two or three city blocks from Ed's place and also four miles south of, four, three or four miles south of Norfolk, Nebraska. Next slide. Another, another view of it. Fresh siding, it looks like. And of course, they've extended it out on the left-hand side. Next slide. Eddie Kayhouse, uh, Kayhouse Barber Shop, which you can actually see in Chapman, Nebraska. It's been freshly painted. Not in, not in this picture. Uh, next slide is a portrait of Uncle Ed, which uh, which is owned by Phyllis McCain, who lives in the house, and. My favorite slide, and one I'm certainly glad Phyllis let me use, and that's this one, where you get to see Uncle Harry and, and Wright and Morris together. I didn't know this existed until she showed it to me uh, about a year ago and allowed me to use it. By the way, she uh, would love to have people to see that house, so if you're ever up in Norfolk, uh, or if, you want, if you want her phone number, I'll give it to you, because she would love to have people in that house. Um, I could stop here, or I could finish my three pages. There's a lot of talk in the rest. What do you think, Meredith? I'm not going to. I'm going to quit. I'm going to. I'm going to break my way slowly toward my conclusion. And that is. Can you work your way through some slides to get to next, next? Next, 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 next. I was, uh, could you go back one? I wanted to talk a little bit about this, but I, I don't have time. In, in this house, 
in this book, a very, very small book, Morris has um, another Nebraska house that um, an 82-year-old and his, his, his nephew return to. And uh, inside the house are all the collected things that uh, the family has left this woman, and she has recently died. So all of the things that have been collected are in this house, and the house burns down. The house and its weighted contents are completely destroyed, and Joy, one of the, the hippie character, has the last word. Fire purifies, she said, and gave Kermit her big, warm, friendly smile. So the house built in the pioneer era, 19th century, has come to full destruction, signifying perhaps Morris's sense of a loss of viable continuity between past and present worlds. Next slide. This is my conclusion. Obviously, houses are important keys to Morris's Nebraska, probably a result of the many houses, but hardly a home, that he lived in during his boyhood when his father moved him from place to place or farmed him out to neighbors and relatives. The seeming obsession with houses is most obvious in the home place, where the evidence is cumulative. But in occasional references as well in other works to houses in which the carpenter has neglected to put in stairs to the upstairs rooms, or in which miscalculations in upper rooms have windows bottoming at floor level, or in instances where doors open dangerously to porches never built. Next slide. There is something dis distinctly American in these structures and interiors, especially as found on the plains. Here the crucial fact of 19th century life is the drive emblemized by the Homestead Act in the following 50 years. That period that brought out the qualities of courage, fortitude, and determination that Rula Cather so loved to depict. By Morris's time, however, the Depression had descended on the Great Plains, and the rural realities that survived it were often sad truths. Things that had once been whole were now fallen into shabby disrepair, making more meaningful the haunted quality of the inhabitants whose houses were holy, as found so visually immediate in many of Wright Morris's photographs and some of this fiction. Thank you. Sorry I kept you so late. Um, thank you. <laughs>